Hey everybody, welcome back to Mint Out of the Box, the fastest growing action figure opening show here on YouTube. I'm your host, the Godfather of Toys, the J-Bomb. And as you can see today, we're not in the studio. There's not a lot of action figures behind me. But who is with me is one of my best friends growing up. This guy's like a brother to me. And no, he's not just here because of that. He's here because he is part of something pretty amazing. He turned his amazing art ability into... Well, it would probably be best if we let, let him describe it. A few years ago, we started talking and he started showing me these amazing uh, paintings and artwork he was doing de uh, dedicated to players from the Negro Leagues. And funny enough, if you're my age, you only heard of Jackie Robinson and that was it. And you thought that maybe that was all there was. But he did a lot of digging and did some research and, and taught me a thing or two. So you'd probably be better to hear from him. So Bill... Uh, Take it away. So how'd you get into this and what was your inspiration to, of all the things you could have got into painting, what was, what made you do this? Yeah. So me being a Dodger fan, we're lucky enough to get the, uh, maybe the best education on Jackie Robinson that you can get. Other people know about him and, uh, but as a Dodger fan, you just get a lot more. And, uh, you know, I've been a baseball fan my whole life and I like the old aspects of baseball, the historical points. So that's just, that's where I go for inspiration is, is old books, look at old videos and things like that. And uh, a friend of ours, Ryan Scruggum, he had given me this set of uh, books. And uh, I mean, you want to talk about some really cool stuff to see about baseballs in these things. And flipping through, you, you, open up to this uh, Negro League baseball section and uh, yeah they really just showed me a lot more than I knew and uh, if if the camera can see behind me there's a, a painting of Jackie Robin I mean a, of Josh Gibson back there and that was the first one that I painted I found that picture from the book and uh, that one grew to 18 paintings and and that really wasn't the end of the journey. It kind of took off from there. Yeah, yeah. It's one thing led to another. And I had put that uh, series in an exhibit at the Museum of Tolerance in L.A. And uh, I met a guy who's, who's an author, a filmmaker named Byron. And uh, his dad was uh, an umpire in the Negro Leagues. Nice. So he got, he rode on a bus with Hank Aaron when he was a kid. And he... he knew Willie Mays. I mean, think of a name and he knew the guy. And uh, yeah, and then from there, it just kind of like spawned into this whole making baseball artwork thing for, for money. And that's so, kinda weird. so how many years now have you been doing this kind of full time? 2009. Wow. Yeah. And as you can see, and, and throughout throughout this, uh, this episode, we are going to be pasting in some of the artwork. So... As when we were kids, we were obsessed with baseball cards. Yes. But if you're uh, kids of the '80s, like we were, you got Topps, Don Russ, and Fleer baseball cards. So if you if your favorite player was an All Star, you might you would get those three cards. Maybe an All Star card, maybe some kind of special insert. But you would probably generally get four to five, maybe six cards a year. Then Upper Deck came around, and that's when the boom kind of took off, and yes. you're getting. And he was a huge Will Clark fan. Uh, I was a huge Kirby Puckett fan, but back then you, we kind of liked. It wasn't just that we had our favorite teams like we do. It seemed like as we got older, you gravitate towards one team. Yeah. You can't, you can't do it like you did when you were yes. a kid because life gets in the way. But it was always one of those things we could sit down and watch whatever game was on, and we could, you would trade for cards of players that weren't maybe your favorite player but i still remember trading a glenn davis card off of you because he was in his baltimore jersey and i was like oh man i gotta have that yeah so um so that gets me into baseball cards the baseball card for me i kind of grew out of it and kind of put it away for a while and then kind of got back into it and i just really was really not a fan of the newer newer stuff it seemed like when the guys that I grew up with started retiring. I started collecting more and more angel cards, but the thing that was getting to me was, like I'll take for instance, one of my favorite players, Mike Trout. I had 
40 Mike Trout cards before he ever stepped foot on a major league field. And there's a couple other players that never stepped on the on the field. I have more of their cards <laughs> than I did than I did of a, a, a ten year big leaguer that that came up in '79. Yeah. So it is is really is a really weird. And then the different colors and this and I'm sitting there going, why am I spending so much money for the same card but it has nine different colors? Yeah. So you did something that I thought was f- pretty amazing and started doing your own art, your own cards. So what made you decide to get in, into that? Well, funny you bring that up because remember a long time ago, my mom had set up a, a big six foot plastic table in her living room at the house. And it was like me, you, Fredo, I don't know, maybe Smurlo, my brother, Chris. And we were cutting out magazine clippings. Oh, I remember that. And then gluing those magazine clippings to our duplicate baseball cards of our favorite player. So even back in the early 90s, we were finding things to do with the duplicates, all right? You know, like I have boxes of Will Clark cards now, like since I'm a huge collector, 150 of of a single card. I do the same thing. Yeah, and it's from buying up people's collections and then they just send you everything they got. And uh, rather than just let those things rot in a box, you know, do something with it. And so some of these handcrafted cards will have four different cards cut up into it and put in just different materials. It was just really something that spawned during COVID. uh, A lot of people that I associated with baseball-wise on on Instagram and stuff, uh, we just started doing it and trading amongst ourselves you know you get one guy's style you do your style he makes a will clark i make a kirby puckett and we do the trade and then and then people were buying them and yeah it was just it was just something to do and it was something to do with uh the junk wax cards you know what i'm saying like may as well take a couple of them off the market oh yeah i it's funny because there i when i started back getting all the angel players I started connecting with the guys online and I would buy I was they noticed I'm buying this rookie that has never got called up and there's no fanfare about him. So I started making deals with guys and they would tell me, "Hey, I open up and, t- and it just killed me inside because it's like I open up a case to get two cards out of and then I don't care about the rest." Yeah. So I made these deals with guys, "Hey, send me all they said if you pay if you pay pound me the shipping I'll send you every angel I open up so I'm like cool for five six bucks I'll get every angel rookie and I'm in a minor league town I'm a host family guy yeah. so I'm able to get these cards autographed I'm building my little collection well then a, a, a thing happened in 2010 called Mike Trout yeah and these guys were pissed because for three years they were sending me every Mike Trout card they had and they're turning around seeing these cards are $200 a piece now. So that dried, that dried up. So then I'm out there facing the world again because now people are keeping everything going. You never know who's going to hit. Yeah. So these guys probably got all this stuff everywhere. So now I'm forced to actually go out there and start paying for, for all my stuff. But I, I kind of got frustrated and said to myself, like, as, as much as baseball has evolved and as much as collecting has evolved, it seems like baseball card collecting hasn't. It, in, I guess in a way you could go all the variants and all that is evolving, but how creatively bankrupt is that? That, oh, I'm just going to use the same card, but I'm just going to change the border. Yeah, uh, for, for me, collecting... Uh, all right, I stopped collecting like cold turkey in 1992. I, I remember the last show I went to, I remember the last card I bought. And then life happens you start making babies you start getting divorced you start having bills you all these all these things okay that get in the way and then like not a darn baseball card from 92 until 2016 and uh then i was like dude i want to build on my will clark collection you know i had a decent one uh, but it was a kid's collection it was 18 years old and that was it it was a stop dead I don't want me to cut you off. Yeah. Do you remember how close you were to bestowing that to me? I do. I do. And I remember I remember thinking about it and thinking about it. And, and then you, whatever it was, I don't know minute. if you even were like, yeah. 
maybe like, you should keep you sure? that one. Yeah. And uh, I'm glad I did because, uh, I don't know, as you get older, innocence is lost, taken, stolen, whatever it is, bad choice you made. And so that, collect, that little collection symbolized a, a time in my life where I didn't even have a girlfriend. At that point, all I had was a group of, of friends. Me. My, my, yeah, <laughs> my, my boys, okay? And I realized, now I realize that in a young man's life, you need that, okay? You need your, you need your, your homies, okay? There's a, there's a different relationship that happens with them when a girl comes into the mix. And I'm not saying this in a negative way. It's just what happens. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so that that card collection symbolized this really strong point in my life where there was none of that exterior disturbance with you growing with your friends. You yeah. know what I'm saying? No. And, and see, and, and, and that right there, that little story right there, that encapsulates, encapsulates this entire, why I do this channel, why I do this show, why the collecting hobby, because anybody can go to a store, buy something, open it up and go whatever. Or, because there are people out there that go buy these things, they don't even know what they're buying and they put them away and they think there's, there's money to be made somewhere right. or they can look on offer up. My whole thing to, to, to the hobby, to the action figures, to the baseball cards, it's, I, I can pick up an 87 tops card of anybody and remember I can smell that card I can touch that card I can look I can remember getting that first pack I can remember when I oh man these are out I, I remember trading them I remember like a guy was in the league six years and I remember all the RBIs I can tell you how many stolen bases you, you knew all these things and it goes back to there's that time in your life where you have no responsibility like Making sure your cards are in order is like your biggest responsibility. Like I didn't even let things like grades get in the way, like homework. I never let that yeah, get in the way. Right. Where we would set up a tent in your backyard, and the only thing in there were pillows, blankets, and our stacks of folders, yeah. baseball card folders. Yeah. The same ones we've looked at every single day that we could have easily left in the house somewhere. I could have left at my house, but they were always with us. And then when we weren't doing that, we were playing catch or playing wiffle ball. So like. All right, as a kid, I maybe had 95% of all the Star Wars stuff that came out until G.I. Joe came out, and then that was the new thing Dang. to do. Okay, and then Star Wars was, all right. But that wasn't collecting. No, that was... Okay, because if it was a collection, I'd still have it. It was things that I really liked. To play that with. And that they're buried between my mom's yard and the neighbor's yard, just <laughs> in the dirt somewhere, I can guarantee it. So that wasn't a collection. When you get older, and this is a teen thing, the base because I didn't collect baseball cards as a child. Yeah. I started collecting at maybe fifteen or something like that. And uh, you're organizing, you're doing things. It's 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 more than just like throwing stuff in a box, you know what I mean? And you're taking your time, you're doing things by year, by company, you're going out of your way to buy sweet sleeves to save this thing. It's an effort, all right? It's energy. Yeah, you know, it's 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 something to do. And I, I feel like in, I keep, I, I, I will always compare my childhood to the childhoods of the kids today. Like, I didn't sit and, yeah, I played video games, but I didn't play video games like that, like, how many times we just go across the street when you were at my house and go play over the line, wiffle ball, just or be outside and go hit the ball over the hospital, and and just that type of stuff like, and there's and especially after last year, COVID, your work, dude, you couldn't. I mean, going outside, people look at you cross even, so it was one of those real good hobbies that that you use your hands you use thought it gives you excitement on what's gonna come out if you don't have it it gives you something to search for and it's just it's it's an innocent hobby no one gets hurt from it and and the, the way i collect today 
would be like if I was a kid. I don't go for graded cards. I don't, I'm not in that rat race. You know what I'm saying? And you know how I feel about graded anything. Yeah, I'm not in that, that, um, and I associate with Will Clark collectors that are really, really like that. And that's fine. Whatever you want to do, you do that, okay? But for me, I might have the best Will Clark collection on a budget that it is possibly out there. It's the most creative. My stuff is still in folders. I don't have to go to a box and flip through cards and plastic cases yeah. to look at my stuff. And uh, I mean, I've kind of, the collecting has taken a back seat maybe this last year because of whatever it is. Let's go. Yeah. Just different efforts going yeah. other places. But, but it's nice to have that to like when late at night she goes to bed or whatever and I could just go sit at that desk, turn one light on in the dark and I could flip through the thing and, and it just takes me back. And see, and that's the thing I didn't, I, because people are always telling me with all the Mike Trout cards you have, you can get them graded and all that. I was like, because those cards right now are cards. They're, there's something I've had him sign. There's things I've collected. When it gets put in that plastic case, it becomes a thing. Mm -hmm. It becomes an asset. It becomes something that you need to you need to like look after. You have to register it. It becomes it becomes to me no different than your car or something that you buy, like a television or something. Piece of jewelry or whatever. It just it's just not the same thing, and it takes away from what it is. And I could sit on my soapbox forever and preach about this, that, and the other thing when it comes to that. But what he's he's kind he's pretty much saying what I've been saying the the length of this channel is the collecting is something that needs to grab you inside it needs to make you feel something and that's who I'm appealing to when when you guys when I get the emails and the texts from people going I don't believe you're 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 opening that you know what you could have sold that for I don't care I've given more things away than I've ever sold that that's I can unequivocally say I've because I would rather give him a Will Clark something that I could sell for $100 because I know it's going to come to a place where it's appreciated, yeah. it's respected, and it's put into a collection. As you saw, my other friend, Bill, that I did a video with his Star Trek, I donated all my Star Trek stuff to his Star Trek room because that's where it belonged. It's awesome. And and that's, I I'm I kind of look at myself as like a, like a, someone that runs a, a dog kennel <laughs> for collectibles. I'll rehome it. I'd rather rehome it to a place I know it's going to yeah. be loved and cherished. And I know it sounds weird, but everyone out there that's watching this that has a collection, like I said, I was telling him before we started filming today, I, I, got, I found a Rob Deere bobblehead. And I just remembered watching Rob Deere hit a home run 500 feet or strike yeah. out. So I went back and bought all Rob Deere's cards so I could have a Rob Deere collection. It wasn't that hard, and it cost me probably like under 20 bucks. Yeah. But I sat there for an hour last night, thumbing through these Rob Deere cards, and like just every one, and, and I put, I think I even posted it. Rob Deere signed the shittiest autograph I've ever gotten, but I still have it because, and I don't care how shitty it is because he took the time to, to stop for a fourteen year old kid mm -hmm. and sign that card. Yeah. When Robin Yount, the Hall of Famer, walked up right behind him and signed a beautiful, beautiful autograph for me. But I still ha I still have that Rob Deere card. I actually gave I actually rehomed that Rob Deere card to my friend Jeremy, who's from Wisconsin. Cool. So now it's in his collection because him and his wife are both from. They both come out here. They meet. They're from Milwaukee. They meet out here. Get married. And she likes he likes the Cardinals. She likes the Brewers, but he likes the Brewers too. So I felt that yeah needed to be there. Yeah. So. So, we got a couple more things I want to hit on. You have a big event coming up. Yeah. All right, we're we're here in La. I don't know if you guys know that I talk about how hot it is in California. We're we are from Los Angeles. Me and him are the same age. I think we're two weeks apart. Yeah. We were here in 1981, 1982. We we witnessed. Yeah, we just got to look for producer Steph, who wasn't born yet. But <laughs> we were here for Fernando Mania, and at our age, it was just a thing. Yeah. But as fans, when we go back and look, that was an amazing, that year right now would be an amazing rookie year. Yeah, like, as a kid, both of us grew up in pretty uh, racially diverse neighborhoods. Uh, and that's 
I mean, diverse. Yes. So, so when Fernando pitched, a portion of that diversity would be just on fire in the background of the whole city. I mean, you would hear people cheering audibly like I never really heard for any other baseball game. You know what I'm saying? And uh, But even back then, I didn't understand really how important it was culturally. You know, you're a little kid, you don't understand that. As I got older, and especially this past year where they're celebrating the 40th anniversary of Fernando Mania. 40 years. You can really look back and be like, wow, dude, I was maybe seven years old when that was going on. And the reason why everybody was screaming in the background was because they were being represented finally in the game. And this was, and you guys got to remember, this is a time where around that time it, it it started to change but i mean maybe earlier like maybe four or five years earlier earlier in the 70s you could name hispanic players in baseball like you could name black players in hockey at one point right it right. There, it was there wasn't a big representation i mean if you look at it now venezuela just recently is is having representation in baseball and I remember when Andres Galarraga was the only yeah. person from Venezuela. And that was, and Andres Galarraga was like, that was like the most ethnic thing you could say at some point because <laughs> it was such a, a crazy name. Yeah. And then you started getting guys from Puerto Rico and you started getting guys from Dominican Republic. And like, that's commonplace now, but back then, especially, and, and it's kind of funny now that there's still not a huge presence in the major leagues of guys from just from mexico no no there is not you're starting to see it now with some of the kids now but i mean a lot of those kids are are mexican-american or put it this way fernando valenzuela to this day is still the greatest mexican baseball player in the mlb in 40 years 40 years and his and he he is he is a lot like a lot of players at that time that had this huge two, three, four years of dominance and then kind of mediocre. There was a lot of guys that have that weird career arc. There's some guys that build up and then down. Then some guys, because I was talking, when we were talking about Fernando the other day when I was telling someone come here to film this, we talked about Kevin Seitzer. Remember him? Yeah, I remember him. He hit 200, 200 hits for like the first three, four years. And then one day I was thinking to myself, what about the Kevin Seitzer? And I look and it's 200, 200, 200, 200. Down till he's out of the league in I think maybe eight years, and it's weird. It's like how do you come into the league hitting two two hundred hits for all those for two three years, and then you're out of baseball, and it just goes to show that like you're not guaranteed. No, I, not. I think people d- don't really respect like you see someone has a twenty year career, like you see someone like a Ken Griffey or, or an Albert Pujols for right now. Yeah, and you don't you just you just take for granted that he's been he's. He's been around. Or you take so for long. granted that, like, Albert Pujols' first 10 years in the major leagues are Hall of Fame. He could have quit in 10 years and he had a Hall of Fame career, okay? And how, even me, I was rough on Albert Pujols once his Angels c- career started to, to take play because the numbers weren't the same. No, I w- but but when, you're, when you're that good, how can the numbers stay the same? You know what I'm saying? And, like, when, and when they do, people take it for granted. And even his numbers for the first eight or nine years with the, the Angels were like numbers that anybody would have taken but as a pro player. But, but they weren't his. But they weren't what he was doing. Yeah. So sports in general are one of those things where, man, you could be you're up one day and you're down the next and and that's just the way it seems it was like it wasn't until i got older and started looking at things that i saw just how rare like uh, a running back having a 10-year career like emmett smith and then you then i'd see guys uh clinton portis guys like that um i can't think of his name right now he played for atlanta was a running back with jamal anderson had these amazing years but he's six years that's it they're, and they're gone. That's it. And I and I think as fans, especially from our generation, we got so used to these guys having these 15, 16, 17-year Hall of Fame careers. Yeah. I mean, there were guys that didn't make it to Hall of Fame that still played 18, 19, 20 years. Will Clark played 15 years, and he didn't have a Hall of Fame career. And at a certain and, – and talk about having that 
those huge years. If someone would have told me in 1990 that Will Clark and Don Mattingly wouldn't have made it in the Hall of Fame, I would have slapped them. Yeah. Like, Back, backhanded twice. And then if it, you, someone would have told me that, um, who was that, uh, Harold Baines would have been in the Hall of Fame and they wouldn't. It would have been double backhanded yeah. again. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 you know, it just goes to show. And that, and I'm going to make one last point and then we'll get into some of the other things. We'll get back to the Fernando event. Um, the one good, I think the the one positive of because right now we're in a we're in a in a in a and we're having this this spot in history right now where Bonds, McGuire, Canseco, Clemens, all these guys should be going to the Hall of Fame every year, and they're just not going to, not yet. I think they'll get, they'll get there. So they have to put somebody in there. So you're you're gonna see the Baines. Tim Raines. Oh, I agree, and I and I know where you're going with this because the the the, the steroid thing really like when you're not on a level playing field, what you have is the steroids that, like I said, it's not for muscles; it's for being able to play tomorrow. All right, that and, and the hardest thing for an athlete to do is to be ready to play tomorrow. When you're hurt, playing tomorrow seems like the hardest thing to possibly do. So many players play hurt. It's perfect, perfect example. Will Clark started out with a Hall of Fame career. I mean, like you said, if in 1990 someone told you otherwise, you would have smacked him. Injuries, being human, play into this, okay? Will Clark started to get injuries and didn't succumb to the pressure of the steroids, which would have probably given him all the numbers to, to boost him right back up. So... The way the game is going today, you're also going to have players with numbers that are all the way... Those standard number of 3,000 hits, good luck. 500 home runs, good luck. 300, 300 wins, wins uh, you will never see that again. No. So you have to start conditioning people to accept that you may have to start putting guys with 300 home runs in or guys with 200 and. 20 wins are going to make the Hall of Fame now. Or you have to start looking at a guy like Albert Bell that had a 10-year career, but that 10-year career is greater than some guys' 20-year careers. Yeah. Yeah. So. And thing and things like uh, Albert Bell's problem is his attitude. Yeah, people and like sometimes him. things like that shouldn't matter and they do. And, and I mean, somebody like Ted Williams, if he didn't have the numbers, he wouldn't have got into the Hall of Fame with 499 home runs because he wasn't great with the press. I heard, and then Dave Kingman. I remember hearing a story about Dave, how Dave Kingman was on the bubble to get in because all the home runs he hit. And a sports writer openly bragged about how when he was a kid, Kingman took his ball and threw it in the puddle. And now he, and he bragged how happy he was that he was able to write no that he couldn't get in the Hall of Fame. Which is crap because I got dissed by a lot of baseball players as kids growing up, but they still deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. Well, you're not. You're okay. We were lucky. Like we we talked about this, getting autographs and stuff. We were lucky to meet tons of players, like without a gate in between and things like that. And so, I have a different. Oh, you you remember? I got dissed by my favorite player, like in I. Um, I know you guys wait to bring that shit up sometimes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, but the great thing is how life and social media should always have worked. The the How horrible that day was, yeah. years later you were able to have an even more amazing experience with yeah, Will Clark. And, and, and the reason being was is because I never held it against Will Clark. Not you any, know, really can't. You can't. You know what I'm saying? These guys deal with it on on the daily at every stadium, everywhere they go. Everybody wants a piece of them, and that's just the way it was. So I didn't hold it against him, and yet life came back. I was still a zealous, zealous Will Clark fan, and uh, I got to go to San Francisco and meet the guy because uh, <laughs> cause of my, my loud Will Clark fandom. But um, that that's enough story. Maybe we'll... we'll pick that up on another yeah. episode but um so the fernando event is you're putting on where is it at when is it happening yeah. how can we get people out there to this yeah october 9th uh i would say five to nine o'clock but 
most of the day we'll be we'll be doing it. It's uh, at the Packing House in Pomona. I don't know the address, but we'll have it. We'll, yeah, we'll have that for you. Packing House, and uh, yeah, it's gonna run that week, maybe longer, and uh, a portion of the proceeds from any sales will go to uh, the unaccompanied minors at the Pomona Fairplex. Awesome. So it's, so it's it's a fun thing for Dodger fans, especially some of the guys. Like I said, I I know a lot of guys that are asking me, hey, do you remember all that? And I get, I get to share the stories, and now they'll go bring their kids, bring their families, they get to experience that. But before we get out of here, it wouldn't be mint out of the box if we didn't take something mint out of the box. Bill's taking something out of his collection. Yeah. Starting lineups came out, and it was in 1987, and it was a big deal for us because there was one more thing we could collect because yeah. you got another card, yep. and you, you got to display something. And... We weren't really playing with figures anymore. We were in the mode of setting them yeah, up. Yeah, setting things. them up. And these were perfect. Yep. So he had an extra one, and we're going to open this up. Yeah, so uh, I have two of these, and uh, I'm actually glad to open this one up because for whatever reason, the the, the plastic is yellow. So yeah. and uh, I'm going to turn this one into a uh, uh, Baltimore Oriole, awesome. Will Clark. So yeah, that, I need to get in one. there anyway. So, yeah, cool, man. I'm going to open this up. Uh, time, time's helping you out. <laughs> oh, shoot. You know, these figures were super rudimentary. A lot of them all had the same poses. But and not a lot of detail when it came to the outline of the jerseys and all that. But you don't understand the excitement when we found... I'm we're stoked right now, dude. <laughs> I, I mean, really, I haven't opened, I haven't taken one of these out of the package since maybe 1991, <laughs> you know what I mean? So this is a trip, and I'm also tripping out on the uh, road grays with the Giants across the front, not San Francisco they, on they the don't, chest. Yeah, they don't, they don't make them anymore. <laughs> so trip out, dude. Mint out of the box right here. So I think that'll wrap it up. Um, we'll have all the information down in the, in the, in the description box. We'll flash it up on the screen. Please come out to to the event and check out all, all things Fernando Valenzuela. There's probably like gonna be a lot of other things out there. It's a nice part of town. There's some yeah, cool stuff yeah. out there. Yeah, it, places it's to eat during the art walk. So this you can go somewhere else and check it out. Walk to the town. So there's probably something. So if you if your girl don't want ain't into baseball, there's something for her to do yes, too. Yes, absolutely. So Bill, thank you for bringing us in here, letting us take a look at all your amazing stuff. We're gonna have, like I said, we're gonna be putting the show together so we can get as much of that stuff in here so you guys can see it. Um, follow him. What's your Instagram? Uh, at Modern Baseball Art, and my website is BillCormalisJr.com. And stuff's for sale. And you see any stuff? Uh, make an inquiry. Um, take a look and add some of the stuff to your collection. So for everybody here at Mint Out of the Box, thanks for for this for hanging in there with us. This is a long episode. Hope you guys learned something. Hope you had a good time going down memory lane with us. Yeah. Have a good one. I'll see you next week.